That last set of string exercises was uh, a little bit intense. Certainly those exercises would make good practice, but they were like project style questions and maybe not the kind of thing that you would do if you just want some quick practice using strings beyond the sort of basic exercises that we've already done in class and a few of the other ones that have already been posted. So maybe we should go back and ask ChatGPT for maybe like something in the middle. Um, okay, so I want to practice writing code involving strings in C. Uh, I'm going to ask it, I, I guess what I want is some exercises that involve writing functions that process strings, because if it suggests that I write a full program, we then end up having to write a whole bunch of stuff like we saw in the last video. Uh, can you give me some programming exercises that involve writing functions which take, which process strings? What I'm looking for uh, is some starter code containing functions where the the body of the function is omitted, I, I guess. I, uh, what I want is some empty functions to implement, just like uh, we see on midterms. Okay, so it, it seems like it's come up with a few examples. Now, I'm skimming over these, and they look a lot like things we actually have already done. So these are lecture exercises, just with different names and things. So uh, exercise one, implement string length. Okay, but we already did that. So I vetoed that one before. Um, string concatenation, we've already done that too. There are I've already made videos where I do this one. Um, and then string comparison. Okay, this is the string compare function. Uh, so you, you might better know it as this function here. Um, and there's a whole set of notes about this. I'm not going to do this one either. Um, okay, wait, here's a reverse string. Nope. Okay, we did reverse string. I'm not going to do reverse string again. Um, okay, so um, those are great. I'll just ask it for more of the same. Um, can I have more exercises? Uh, and can you combine all of the functions into a single program? Maybe it's easier if I just write one set of functions in one file. All right, here are more exercises. Yeah, string copy. Okay, so I'm not going to do string copy. Um, we've already done that. That's why. Um, substring extraction. Okay, that we could do that. Um, combined. Okay, there's the combined program. Okay, yeah, I just want... Mm, um, I'm going to ask it for even more. The best, the only one it's come up with that I like so far is substring. All of the other ones we've either already done in this series or there are other videos I've posted before and lecture examples that I do every year that involve me writing that in front of the class. So I don't want to... I, I, we don't need to belabor those. Um, of those, the only one that I want to do is exercise six. Um, can you make some more exercises, uh, including exercise six plus two new, two new problems um, as one large combined program? This is, it, it, you know, I give it a hard time for not understanding what I mean some of the time. If it can understand this, then it does deserve quite a bit of credit. Even I don't quite know what I'm asking for here. All right. Okay, so it's generated a big long program and it's gonna give me a big list of what's going on. Okay, so uh, it looks like I've now got four exercises. Okay, I asked for three, but whatever. It's If it gives me some exercises I can work on, then I'll take it. Um, so here's a combined program with exercise six and two additional string manipulation exercises. And then there's, a th there's another one too. Okay, um, so uh, let's take a look. Substring, that's we already had that. String to upper, okay, well, fair enough. Um, I guess I'll do this. Um, count occurrences, um, this is neat. Okay, so um, this looks, so we've actually done count occurrences in other contexts. Um, it's shown up as a sub-problem of something we did before. Uh, if we talk about counting the occurrence of a single character, but that's not what we're doing here. This seems to be counting how many times another string occurs inside this string. Um, and then this, print char array. Okay, that's sort of weird. Um, it looks like this is just saying, so it says print char array, but what it takes as an argument is just the string or just a, a pointer to a character array, which means this presumably has to be null terminated. In other words, this is just printing a string, which, you know, I can already do. Yeah. Um, 
print each character in a character array. I'm going to ask it what it means by that. Um, isn't exercise nine just printing a string? Now, it's a leading question, so it might just agree with me by default. Oh, it looks like it's having some trouble. You're absolutely... Oh, there it goes again. It's apologizing. Okay. And it looks like it's regenerated the exercise because it, it's... I, I've caught it. Yeah, okay, so... My apologies for the confusion. Exercise 9, as described, would indeed just involve printing a string using a printf statement. Yeah, so when I saw this, it looks like all I have to write for this is just printf percent %s. So it looks like it's gotten rid of the exercise. Um, okay, you can remove exercise 9 and that from the program. Okay, so here's the, com the, the corrected template. I'm going to copy this whole template, um, and then we'll go over here and try and, and write these functions. All right. Uh, okay, so here's the complete template as written by ChatGPT. Um, it looks like oh, exercise six, this description is missing. Maybe I'll go grab that from up above. Um, but I'm glad that I did this. I, I actually think that um, if I'd stuck with the initial set of exercises, it would have been not only sort of useless because we already did those, um, but also it wouldn't give us what we want. Uh, like that is, we want some practice exercises that aren't as intense as, as the exercises in the last video, uh, but are a little bit above maybe some of the things we've already seen. And in particular, what I really like in this series is, I like ChatGPT throwing some questions at me. This is one of them that it's a bit convoluted. So I'm gonna have to play with this a bit. I know what it's asking, but I, I don't think you'd see this question on a midterm. And so it's neat, I think, to do a few exercises that you wouldn't actually see on an assignment or midterm in this course because they're ill-specified or because they're a bit tedious. It is useful to do a few of those just to understand what programmers out there in the wild actually have to put up with every day. Um, because often, you, you know, when you're actually writing code out in the world somewhere, you don't have the convenience of somebody having crafted a programming exercise that just uh, examines some specific learning outcomes or whatever. Sometimes you have to write pretty tedious, annoying code. All right, so I've got these three functions I have to implement. Um, I already know I'm going to need a few other things. So I'm going to um, bring in string.h. I assume I'm probably going to need string copy or string length. I also have a feeling I'm going to need uh, the to upper function because I'm going to be using the string to upper. Uh, I'm going to be writing the string to upper function here. All right, let's uh, see if this compiles as written because ChatGPT generated this and we don't necessarily want to trust it. Okay, it looks like it did. Um, I'm going to do a couple of little, uh, I'm going to touch up a few things about the template here. So um, basically, uh, here is uh, the test case for the substring function. Here is the te test case for the text to upper function. Um, and then here is the test case for count occurrences. Um, what I'm going to do is rearrange them a little bit. And I, I don't think you could hold that against me because that's not really changing anything about the exercise. I basically want to implement string to upper first. Um, all right. And so here's a string that here's its first test case, convert me to uppercase. Um, and so I call string to upper on this string. We can see evidently I'm expected to modify the string in place. So I make a modification to the string that was provided. That's pretty standard in this style of exercise. Then I print out the uppercase string. Okay, so the second one is um, I've got, uh, this is the argument being provided as the input string to my substring function. I am actually going to make this its own variable. So of course it is perfectly valid to pass a string into a function just by putting it in double quotes and passing it right in. But I think for the sake of having an easy uh, tester, if we want to do more complicated testing, um, I'm going to do substring input. I think it's nice to put it in a variable. All right, and so I'll do this. Uh, there we go. I'll just sub that in. Uh, and then down here, when I call the count occurrences function, I've got this. This is the string that's being used as input. Um, and just for the sake of, key, of cleaning up the exercise a bit, although by this point in the course, we should be aware that I am always allowed to write, a, to when I create strings, to create them as type char star and not char array. Um, although there are a variety of reasons why maybe that's not a best practice that we should embrace right now. Um, we'll talk a bit about the relationship between between arrays and pointers. Maybe we already have by the time you're watching this. Um, I want to do a separate video where I talk a bit more about arrays versus pointers. So I'm going to use array notation all the way through here. Um, okay, so uh, what I have is uh, my interpretation of these three exercises. I have this one line description. Um, my interpretation of the three exercises is the string to upper exercise converts every character of the string to uppercase. The string remains the same length. Um, the substring exercise takes some input string as well 
well as a pair of numbers. Um, and the numbers are a start position, so that would be int start, and a length. Um, and then uh, we extract a substring. So I'm going to create, I'm just going to draw a string here to play with. Okay, um, there's a space. Okay, and then the backslash n is there. Um, so let's take a look at these indices here. So I've got this string of length, um, it's of length 11. And the idea is if I call the substring function and I give it, so let's say this is str, there we go. And if I call substring, and I pass it the following arguments. I give it str, and the second argument is a start index, and so my start index, suppose that is three. And then, it's, then I give a length, let's suppose I give a length of five, and then I give somewhere to put the output. Here, it's created this variable called extracted that I can use, so I'll just use that in my example call here. So the idea is what I do is I go through and into the string extracted, I make a copy of every character in my input string starting at this index and proceeding for this number of characters. So I interpret that to mean I start at character three and I walk forwards, okay, there's three, so there's one character, two characters, three characters, four characters, five characters. So the string that I create will be this. It'll be L O space W. I'm not really drawing W's very well this morning. There we go. Um, fix this one too. W O and then null terminator. So notice how this string is of length five. I will need to cr I'll obviously install a null terminator at the end of it. Now, one thing that my substring function is not doing, which I should be a little bit worried about, um, I should at least consider this, is the substring function doesn't actually know how long the output array is. Notice how nowhere in the arguments do I provide it the length of the output array. So if I'm not careful, um, if I write functions that fill up strings or they create new strings in an array that I provide, I have to be careful to make sure that that function doesn't walk off the end of the string. Now in this case, I'm not gonna change the template because that's what ChatGPT gave me. I guess I could ask ChatGPT about this problem, um, but I think this function is safe. And the reason is because the caller provides the length of the substring. So the caller says, I want you to copy nine characters into my output array. And so for that that reason, I would argue that it's the caller's responsibility to make sure that the array that was given is big enough to store whatever length it provided. So the function doesn't need any more information. Um, ChatGPT has apparently used the default length of 20 here. We might, in this course, maybe use a length of 100 for an output buffer, but whatever. In this case, I think it's fine because uh, this, the function is being provided enough information to figure out um, how many characters it should copy. Okay, so that's the substring function. I take an input string, I take a start position, I take a number of characters and a place to put the result. Um, okay, so that's that. Um, and then there is this uh, count occurrences function. Now the count occurrences function, oh, I'm, I'm going to make one more modification. The count occurrences function takes three arguments. And like I said earlier, I would rather um, have all three arguments stored in variables at the moment. So I'll do this. Um, I'm going to call this search string. Um, so the count occurrences function takes a string, I want to call this a large string, it takes some string that might contain a lot of characters, and then it takes another string that's probably smaller, and what it does is it, it asks uh, how many times does this smaller string occur inside of this larger string, um, and then return that number. And I expect that occurrences here, um, the number of occurrences should be two, because the word search appears two times. Another sort of unique thing about the count occurrences function that's really weird, like I would not write a count occurrences function with this signature, is that instead of returning a value, so returning the number of occurrences, which is an int, which it could easily do, the count occurrences function apparently takes a pointer to where it's going to store its result and then stores the number two in this variable, which is sort of weird, but whatever. I mean, that's the template I was given. Let's see if we can do it. Uh, okay, I'm going to go up here. I may make a couple of modifications to these signatures. Maybe I won't. No, I guess I'll leave it the way it is. Um, I'm going to begin by implementing the string to upper function. Now, before I do that, I've, just, I've already compiled the basic template. I'm going to run it to make sure that if I run it without implementing anything, it doesn't crash. And it looks like it doesn't. Okay, so I'm going to begin by writing the string to upper function. Now, the way that I interpret this is um, if 
you ha when I'm writing a function like this, which just takes a string, um, so let's say here's my string here, and then there's the null terminator, so it's an array of length six. Um, I have no other reason in this function to need to get the length of my string as a number, so the way I'm gonna do it is just iterate over the string until I hit the null terminator. I, I don't need the length for anything, so there's no sense in my mind in going and getting the length. Um, one thing I actually, one modification I will make to the template, which won't change anything semantically, is I'm gonna rewrite the types of arguments to put the star on the, uh, on the same side as the type. I I've mentioned in a previous video I like it that way. It is a matter of personal taste and it changes nothing. So having int space star count versus int star space count isn't any different. Neither of those uh, have any difference from each other, uh, but I'm gonna correct that just so that uh, it looks nice via, I guess, the best practices that we're observing in this course. All right, so I'm just gonna iterate through this string. So I'll create an index into the string and I'll just say while um, string sub i is not equal to my null terminator. There we go. Uh, and then I'm just gonna modify str sub i to be the, uh, let's say I'm converting it to uppercase, to be the uppercase version of whatever character was there before. So recall that the to upper function in ctype.h takes a single character, which actually is taken as an int, but we can pass in a char if we want, and then returns the uppercase version of that character. In the event that the character doesn't have an uppercase version, because it's, let's say, already uppercase, or because it's a symbol or a digit, then to upper just returns what, what I sent in without any modification. So I think this is all I need, except of course I need to finish my loop. I have to write I++. So let's give that a try. So that's a nice way of easing into some string and function exercises. Uh, okay, so it looks like my string has now been converted to uppercase. Um, obviously, I need to do a little bit more testing than that, so let's try testing it on a string. Th the string I was given was full of lowercase letters. It had also some spaces and some symbols, that exclamation point. I should also try it out on a string that already contains uppercase letters. Okay, it looks like that worked. Let's try it out on a string that only has one character in it. Looks like that worked as well. Now let's try it out on a string that doesn't contain any letters at all. It just contains symbols and spaces and digits. Okay, a spot check. Well, we can't see whether all the spaces are being preserved because of the template, so I'm just gonna quickly add some square brackets here to make it more obvious that the spaces are staying in, although I think they are. It looks like they definitely are. Okay, that's good. I'm gonna delete this modification I made because I really shouldn't be modifying the template I was given if I wanna follow the rules of the exercise. Um, and I should add that on an assignment, um, if you were given, a, so the assignments we have in this course, for example, where you're given a bunch of empty functions and told to implement them, there are a few things you are not allowed to do. And usually one of the things you're not allowed to do is modify the function signature. Um, so that's why I'm not doing that. I'm sort of tempted to because I don't know if I wanna take a string as const char star, although that is a valid way of doing it, um, but I can modify it, those are the rules. Even that little modification I made where I moved the star, it's sort of borderline. I'm gonna claim I can get away with it because I haven't really changed the type. So I'm adding new spaces to things isn't really a semantic modification, although maybe I still shouldn't do that, but whatever, I already did. Okay, so I'm gonna try running this again just to make sure, actually, hmm, maybe I'm gonna go back to the original test string that we had. Um, let's see, there we go, okay. So just to keep it back at the original test case, because I wanna preserve the template that ChatGPT gave me. There we go, I think I have written now successfully the string to upper function. Okay, so now I want to do the substring function. Um, and I'm just gonna delete that comment because that's useless. Uh, and so remember, let me redraw my, my sort of standard array here. So if I look at the indices, um, let's see. If I were to ask for a substring, if this were my source string, this string here, and I were to give a start value of, let's do two, and a length of, let's do uh, three, then I interpret this to uh, want me to create the substring LLO. And of course, it goes without saying that I'll always need to insert a null terminator. Okay, so that's the way I'm gonna view this. I'm gonna start copying at this index. I'm gonna keep copying for this number of characters, and then I'm going to add an null terminator. And where will I be copying to? It will be to this array that I was passed called result. Now, I mentioned a minute ago that this is a valid way of um, writing this function signature, but just in case you're not familiar with this dual notation, you're probably noticing this weird use of char star here. Um, it is just as valid for me to write something like um, this. So 
and maybe you've already seen this in the course, who knows when you're watching this video, uh, but every time I, I pass an array into a function, I actually have the choice of using, if I'm gonna use the empty brackets, if I use square brackets to pass it in, I could also write it as char star. I could write it as char array or as char star. They are actually equivalent. And you'll find that in idiomatic C, it does tend to be the case that a lot of C programmers would rather write char star than char bracket bracket. Um, before I started teaching C, that was the way I did it too. Um, now that I teach C all the time, when I write C code for any reason, I like to use the two brackets because I've actually, I've grown to like it. It's sort of grown on me over the years. Um, but both these notations are equivalent. So what I'm being passed here, this is a way of passing in a char array, which in this case I interpret to be a string. And the same thing is true here. This result array is where I'm going to put my result. Okay, so I think I'm going to need two indices. And to sketch out why I think that is, it's because if I have my source string and my result string, the substring I'm copying could show up somewhere, that's so weird, it could show up somewhere in the middle of my source string, which means I'm indexing into the source string in the middle, whereas I'm going to be copying into my result string starting at the beginning. So clearly, this beginning index and this middle index aren't going to be the same in a lot of cases, so I think I need two index variables. So I'm going to call them in index, and it's going to start at my start position, and then I'm going to do out index, and it's going to start at zero, because I'm going to copy into my array result starting at index zero. I already mentioned that we need to make sure that the function doesn't inadvertently walk past the end of the result array, but I'm going to interpret, because the caller of the function gave me a length to copy, that they have done their homework, that they have done their due diligence, and made sure that the result array they provided has at least the length that they gave me. So therefore, I, as long as I adhere to the length I was given, I don't think I should worry about accidentally walking past the end of the array. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at the inside my source array at this position and I'm going to keep walking until I get to my length unless I guess I should draw out one special case here. So here's a, a possible string. Suppose I tell you to start at this character here and copy five characters. That's a bit of a problem, because as you can see, the array ends after one character. And there's a question as to whose responsibility that is. One could make, and I think this is sort of a valid argument, you could make the argument that if I tell you to start here and copy five characters, then that's my fault, not your fault. If you walk past the end of the source array because I tell you to start too late, that's, you know, your fault for asking me to do that. On the other hand, you could say, but no, I told you to start at character uh, number, what, zero, one, two, three, four and to copy five things. And uh, it should have been, you should have noticed the string ended. Obviously I can't copy past the end of the string. That's your problem, you the one writing the function. Um, and so I'm actually gonna take that interpretation. If I'm copying characters, even if I'm not yet at the provided length, if I'm copying characters and I run into a null terminator, I'm going to stop immediately because I don't know what to do. I don't wanna walk past the end of the source array. Okay, so I'm going to do that part next, uh, but first I'm going to write a basic loop just to do the copy. So while the in index, uh, actually I should count how many characters I'm copying. There are a lot of ways of doing this. There is a way of doing it with fewer variables. Maybe you, you do it that way, maybe you don't. Uh, I want to do it in a way that makes it pretty clear what I'm, um, what I'm doing to you, but also so that I can be confident that what I'm doing is going to work. So there's a way to avoid making this secondary variable here, but I, I don't see the point. So while the number copied, is less than length, um, or yeah, number copied, yep, is less than length. I'm gonna keep copying characters. So I'm gonna say my result at the result index of out idx is equal to my source string at in, uh, index in idx, and then I increment both. Now, um, for the next set of material, when we talk about strings and arrays and pointers, I will make an observation that if you try this exercise again using pointer arithmetic, there are a bunch of really clever uh, simplifications you can make, including one where you call the string copy function in a clever way. Um, but uh, for now, I won't. I'm just doing the copy manually because I want the code to work because working code is what gets the marks. Uh, okay, so I've got this. Um, I've, I'm going to keep copying until I reach length. Um, I'm going to test this out the way it is, and then I'm going to add that modification to stop if I hit a null terminator. I guess I have one more thing I have to do, which is add a null terminator to my result string in all cases. 
So the reason why I'm just writing this without thinking about it further is, like in previous string exercises that we've done, um, I'm keeping in mind that the index out idx is the next available index in my result string. So at the end of the loop, out idx is exactly where I'm going to want to put the null terminator. I'm going to try running this. I'm not actually done this code yet. I just want to run it once to see if I've gotten the main part, and I definitely haven't. Oh, wow. Um, okay, so it looks like my code has crashed. Um, so uh, the way the test case I was running was I've got this string uh, that's called extract this substring. And I should work out what the output's supposed to be. So there's character 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So character 8 is this T. And I want to copy nine characters. So that's OK. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So apparently, I want to copy these characters here. Uh, and we can see that this is a valid input because I'm copying nine characters from legitimately from the middle of the array that was provided and I'm copying them into this array that has size 20. So it's a valid input and my code is crashing. So something is wrong. Um, if I stare at it for a minute, uh, it may not be obvious. And okay, I actually do see the bug. The bug involves this variable here. But suppose you didn't. And you know, I would forgive you for that because there are lots of times I write code, even code that's only this long, where I can't see the problem. I'm sure I've done everything right and I can't see the problem. What do I do? Well, I could trace it by hand, that would work. I would catch, I, I will bet that if I traced it by hand after about two or three minutes, I would notice the problem and I'd be able to fix it. But suppose that I don't want to trace it by hand, or suppose that I want to try a couple of other quick things before I trace it by hand. One thing I could do is at the end of each iteration, or maybe better at the beginning of each iteration, I could just print out everything I know. So I could say, okay, in idx equals uh, this, out idx equals that. What other variables do I have? num copied uh, equals this. I'm even going to print out start and length just in case. Uh, and then length equals that. Okay, so I'm going to print out literally all the variables I have on hand, all of these these index variables. in idx, out idx, uh, num copied, start and length. There we go. Uh, we'll try running this. Now, the program's still going to crash. I haven't fixed the bug, but maybe it'll print out enough information that I can isolate where the crash is coming from. Because as we know, segmentation fault can mean a whole bunch of different problems. Although, I, I, I will add, if you're working with arrays and you get segmentation faults and you're not doing any other weird pointer shenanigans, odds are your segmentation fault a lot of the time is coming out of walking off the end of an array or otherwise using invalid indices in the array. Okay, so I'm copying nine characters. This extract, uh, this substring I'm trying to extract is supposed to be nine characters long. And immediately I notice a problem. Notice how um, I'm printing out enough lines of output that I'm clearly running this loop for thousands of iterations. And in IDX and out IDX are way past what they're supposed to be. So what gives? Well, hey, what's num copied equal to? The loop is only going to end when I when num copied is equal to length. And we can see here num copied is always stuck at zero. So it turns out that's the bug. Now, I did catch this earlier, but um, it's there are times, and I might have one of these times in one of these videos, where the even if the bug is obvious, you don't see it. You just look right past it. So obviously, I think what's happening is I've forgotten to add one to my num copied variable to add two keep track of how many characters I've copied. I'm not going to delete my little debugging print statement there. I'm just going to try this again and see if this works. And it looks like it does. OK, so this is the string I was e expecting to extract. And it looks like I've extracted it. So I think I can delete this print statement finally. There we go. All right, so the, the substring function is now apparently sort of working. I've got a couple of other things I want to do, though. Um, so before I continue, I want to catch the case where you ask me to copy a substring, and even though you give me a length, it turns out that the original string ends too soon. In other words, if I said start copying this character, this R, and copy 10 characters, well, you could copy 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but then you hit the end of the string. I would like the copy to end immediately if you hit the end of the source string even if you're not yet at the uh, requisite length. And I think the way to do that is to consider that at each step of this loop, this value, or whoops, this value, source at index in idx is the next character to copy. If I notice that the next character to copy is the null terminator, then I guess I've hit the end of my source string. So if source uh, at in idx is equal to null terminator, I want to end the loop. So I'm going to keep going while the number copied is less than length, and um, source at in idx is not equal to null terminator. 
All right, so this still works. Let's see what happens if I start it at, um, I don't really know what position that is. I'm just gonna make one up. Suppose I started at position number 15 and I try and copy 20 characters. Now we know that if I try and copy 20 characters starting a position somewhere around here, that is gonna go past the end of the string. So I'm gonna test my error handling or my ability to catch this case and handle it gracefully. All right, and it starts apparently at the letter B and then gets to the end of the string and apparently stops. I'm gonna add again the square brackets to this template to make sure that we're not copying any invisible junk from after the end of the string. Okay, and it looks like we aren't. It looks like there's nothing past that dot at the end of the string. All right, I'm gonna leave these square brackets in for a minute while I go up and do a couple of other things. Um, actually, I'll do a couple more tests. I wanna clean up this code. Uh, there's one thing I wanna to do to clean the code up. Um, I'm gonna start, let's try copying. Well, what special cases should I consider? Um, I don't know if I need to consider using a different input string because it doesn't seem like anything about the actual character values was used in my implementation, just copying characters around. So if I change these to different characters, I don't know that that's gonna to have too much of an effect. Let's see what happens if I start copying at characters zero and I'll copy let's do three characters so I should expect to see ext in my output string okay it looks like that worked um, let's see what happens if I start at character zero and try copying like 50 characters and again the copy should stop automatically at the end of my input string Okay, it looks like that worked. Um, let's try copying at character one and doing six characters. Uh, all right, um, let's try uh, inverting the, so we notice how in this case, uh, the start position and length, start position is a number that is less than length. Let's try starting at index six and copying two characters, just to make sure that a, a wide variety of different combinations work. Okay, that, I mean, presumably that works. I think this is index six. Um, and now, what if I start at index six and copy zero characters? What do I expect to see? Well, I expect, frankly, that the function in all cases produces a valid string into my array extracted. And so if I copy zero characters, I of course expect the string it produces to be empty, but I do want it to be a string. There needs to be a null terminator in the string. Um, and so I wanna see empty, empty square brackets here. And I do. Okay, so I think at this point I can conclude that the substring function is working. If I intended to use the substring function for really odd cases, so what if my input string had 4,000 characters, I may want to do a few more tests, but I think at this point I can trust it. Um, now I want to do one modification before I move on to the next exercise, which is I want to observe this isn't necessary. So if this were an exam question and you wrote this, then this would be good. We already saw it's correct. This is good. There's no need to do this simplification on an exam or indeed even on an assignment or anywhere else. There really is no requirement in life that you go out and try and uh, reduce the code you write to as few lines as possible. In general, you want code that people can read. You want code that works. And only if the code turns out to be slow do you want to speed the code up usually. So generally you don't need... There are certain techniques you can learn that result in faster code than others, but you don't want to obsess over making your code fast unless you have some reason to believe that it isn't already fast. But one thing I might add that we that could clean it up or at least introduce some other method of writing the code, like one other solution technique, is to observe this. I've got this variable called numCopied. I'm using that to make sure to, to um, uh, count off the number of characters I've copied so far until I get to the length that I was asked for. Um, what I will notice here is that numCopied starts at zero and so does out idx because I start copying at the beginning uh, into the beginning of my result array. Every time I update out idx I update num copied and there's never a case where I change one but I don't change the other and therefore I think it stands to reason that the variable out idx also happens to be the length of the result string that I have so far um, and we sort of already know that this is a this is something we've noticed in a few other exercises so far. Um, if I've already copied these three characters, then out idx will point to the next available space in my result array. And we know already that's the space we can put the null terminator if the copy ends at this point, but also observe that this is index three, which 
corresponds, as it happens, to the length of the string as it currently stands. And so actually, out IDX corresponds to the total number of characters I've already copied. Um, and so I don't actually need these two variables. So I could just replace this with out IDX and then completely clear out my use of the num copied variable. What's interesting about this is that bug that I had earlier that I had to fix probably wouldn't have shown up at all if I'd done this to begin with. But that doesn't mean I should have known to begin with that this was a, a um, this property existed or this was a possibility. I want to write code that works. I want to get there as quickly as I can in a way that's sort of intuitive and comfortable for me. So I use an extra variable. I had to fix a bug, but the code ended up working. Now that it's working, maybe I want to clean it up a little bit. All right, so I'm still copying that string of length zero. Let's do something else. We'll copy, I don't know, six and do four characters. I think that would be T space TH. Okay, there we go. Looks like it's working. Um, I'm going to make the call that I believe that my previous testing um, was sufficient given the relatively minor modification I made for me to believe, to be pretty confident that the substring function works. All right, so what do we have next? We've got the count occurrences function. So the count occurrences function does three, takes three arguments and it's, it's got a couple of quirks. So one of the strangest quirks is the fact that it's supposed to produce a count and then it stores it in this variable that I'm given a pointer to, which is sort of weird because in my mind, we should be returning it. It's an int. And in general, my recommendation of a best practice is um, if you need to return, if what comes out of the function is supposed to be one number, then make it the return value. Don't do this passing in a pointer business. We, of course, can do that. It's a valid technique, but it makes no sense to me if we don't already have a return value. Often you need to have things, uh, parameters to the function that are pointers that you set because you can't return the value that you want. We do that for strings. So if I want to create a string, I have to pass in an array because I can't have the function return an array for reasons that are clear in the other videos and in, in the lecture videos um, and in the lectures themselves. But um, if I want to, if I have an int that I want to um, escape from the function, why not just have it be the return value of the function? Okay, whatever. There's my complaint about that. I am going to do the exercise as it is written. Um, what I'm going to do though is I'm basically going to keep the count in my own int variable. So I'll just call it C. Um, this will, we will use to keep track of the count. I'm just going to use my own variable to keep track of the count. Maybe I'll call it the count. Calling the variable C is a bit, that might be a bit sloppy. And then at the end, I'm just going to set this, this pointer. So I'll do star count. So start at count, follow an arrow. Um, that's going to be set to whatever ends up in my variable the count. The reason I'm doing this is because I would like to, as I count things off, be able to write stuff like the count plus plus. The problem is um, if I were to use this variable directly, I have to do something a little bit uncomfortable looking like something like star count plus plus. Uh, I don't know if I want to do that. Um, now, maybe I'll go back later and fix it up so I do that, but for now, I'd like to work with a regular int because that fits in better to the model I have of maybe the kind of loops that I want to write. Okay, so um, how, how will I draw this out? I think I'll just skim over uh, the, the testing code to give an example of what I think I should do here. So the idea is you're given two strings. Uh, I'm going to call them a large string and a small string, although really this string could be as long as I want it to be. Um, and what my goal is to take the small string and see how many times the entire small string occurs in the larger string. So the word search occurs two times, and that's the count I'm going to return. Um, and we should remember, though, that the the, um, the small string doesn't have to be a complete word, so it could just be some word fragment or something. Is there any word fragment that might be interesting here? Well, I mean, I could do EA or something like that, and EA still just occurs two times um, in my original string. But what I'm doing is looking for a particular substring inside of this larger string. In a certain way, this, has, this is sort of a relative, a cousin of the substring function. The substring function is cutting out a segment from inside of a string. The count occurrences function is looking for a segment inside of some larger string. Okay, here is how I'm going to do that. Um, if I want to find where this thing occurs inside of this bigger string, what I could do is I could consider all start positions, all positions where this string could begin, and just see whether, so for example, I start at position zero, and I'll just see whether are the next six characters equal to my small string. The answer here is yes. If I start at position one, I could ask that question, and the answer is going to be no. If I start at position two, the answer is going to be no. If I start at position three, the answer is going to be Going to be no. Maybe you get the idea. And then eventually I get down here and I say, are the next six characters equal to my small string? Well, yes. 
right? So what I do is I'm going to loop over all possible starting positions for my small string inside my big string. And for each of those starting positions, I'm going to ask the question, um, does the small string, does every character in the small string occur starting at this starting position? I'm going to now write that out as a comment. Um, okay, so here's my algorithm. For each starting index in um, the input string, um, in, hmm, in text. So the large string is called text here, which I, I can't change that name, but that's a little bit vague, but okay, that's the large string, text. For each starting index in text, I guess I shouldn't put it in quotes, um, determine whether um, the, the characters in search occur starting at that starting position. All right, that's my algorithm. So I need a loop that loops over every index in my string text. I'm going to use a loop pretty similar to this one here. In fact, I will actually copy and paste it. So I'm going to loop along through my string until I hit the null terminator. This is not the only way of doing it. I could, of course, get the length of my string and just use a for loop that iterates up to that. Um, OK, so while text sub i is not equal to null terminator, I'm now going to check whether um, the characters of search occurs starting at position i of uh, text. Now, if you know about pointer arithmetic in strings, which is the subject of the next sequence of videos, there are a bunch of clever things we could do here, um, but we don't know about that, so I'm just going to do this manually. There are a couple of ways I could approach this. So I could write a function that does this. I could write a function that you give it two strings, um, a large string and a small string, and you give it a starting position inside the large string, and then you go check, and the function runs a loop. Or I could just write that loop right here. I think I'm just going to write that loop right here. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, let me see, actually, you know, hmm, the more I think about it, the more I do sort of want to, to write a function. Um, okay, I'm going to write a function for that. So I, I changed my mind. So again, this is what happens when I record these videos live. Um, is match. So I'm going to basically write this function that says, um, I'll write a signature for it. So is match large string, small string, start, oh, actually, I'll do large string, then a start position, then small string. Um, determines, uh, checks whether the small string occurs inside the large string, starting, okay, uh, starting at the provided start position. All right, and then I'm just going to write the return value, return value, which is an int um, one if um, the small string occurs starting at the provided start position and um, really Jupyter Hub's really fighting me on the indentation today, uh, zero otherwise. And then what are the parameters? I guess I should write those out too. We should do this properly. And uh, although maybe even when you, certainly when you watch this, you think this is a bit tedious, it's strange how writing this out, even writing it in the formal um, format that we're used to, it's tedious to write it out, but it does make the function easier to write. You've got a much better idea of what you're doing. Uh, large string is a string, uh, start position is an int, uh, and small string is also a string. Okay. Uh, now, I've had the reason I put small string as the third argument is to make it really obvious that the start position sort of ap applies to my large string. Okay. And now, when I write this function, I'm not going to use the char star notation. I'm just for the sake of uh, variety. And because I think I like this notation better, especially in the context of this course, I'm going to use the array style notation. Remember that they are equivalent. I could write char star large string instead of char large string bracket bracket um, in start position. And uh, let's see, and then char star, or whoops, char small string. And you already know in this course that um, the empty uh, square bracket notation is only something you should use if you have uh, a function taking arrays of indeterminate size. If the function is taking a, an array size as one of its other parameters, then you should put that array size in the square brackets. And, and that means in this course, you shouldn't be using the star notation in those cases. But for strings, this would be equivalent to if I wrote, um, if I just wrote char 
char, st whoops, there's that page down button again. Um, this would be equivalent to if I just wrote char star here instead of putting the square brackets. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to use the square brackets. All right. So now what I'm going to do is I've got my start position. I'm going to walk through um, my small string and my large string. And I'm going to use one index variable here. So here's my start position. And then, so up top, that's my large string. This is my small string. What I'm going to do is I'm going to compare the character at start position plus zero with the character at index zero of my small string. Uh, I'm going to compare the character at start position plus one with index one of my small string. At start position plus two, whoops, with index two of my small string. And you can see there that if I just use one index variable that counts off starting at zero, I can actually use the same index variable with both strings as long as I offset it by my start position if I use the large string. Okay, so that's my goal. And of course, because this is basically a string comparison function, if I notice any case where the two characters aren't equal, then I know that the answer is false, that there isn't a match. All right, so int i equals zero. Um, now I'm going to use a while loop for this. Um, I've got a couple of things I have to deal with here. So um, if I hit the end of either string, then um, I need to stop immediately. Um, and I I've got to worry about one weird special case in a minute, but I'm going to start with that. So while large string at index start position um, plus i is not equal to the null terminator and small string at position i is not equal to the null terminator, um, then I'm going to ask the question, uh, uh, which would be, actually, I'm just going to, I can steal some of this for my if statement. So I'm going to ask, is large string at position i plus start position equal to small string at position i? If the answer is yes, then we're good. But if the answer is no, if this is not equal to this, well, that means I don't have a match. And of course, I love early returns. That means I'm done. OK, so if I ever hit this situation here, I don't have a match. So I'll just say not a match. And I'm done. And then conversely, as usual in this style of algorithm, um, if I get all the way to the end and I haven't found evidence that there isn't a match, well, that means that there is a match. Uh, and so I'm going to return 1. Uh, and then down here, I've got to remember to add 1 to i. And there is there is actually a mistake in this. There's one case that it's not covering. And it's, it's sort of subtle. Um, so suppose that my big string looks sort of like this. So I, I, I'm comparing something starting at the end, h, e, L, and then I've got the null terminator. And my small string is H, E, L, L, O, and, and then the null terminator. The way that this test is written, so if I start at this position here, I'll compare, char and so here's character 0, 1, 2. Uh, and so I compare this to this, and, and that's good. I compare this to this, and that's good. And so now the index is going to line up at the L. There we go. And I compare this to this, and that's good. And now the index is lining up at the null terminator. And that means that the loop condition is violated and the loop ends. And so I get down here. But the, there wasn't a match. My small string wasn't found at this position of my large string, just the beginning of the small string. There are still characters left over in my small string. And so I don't have a match. But the loop ended before I could figure that out. Now, there are a couple of ways I could simplify this down. So one of them is it actually turns out this condition is not necessary. If I just have essentially one half of this condition, then actually everything is still going to work. But I like the condition because it gives me a sense of security. I know that under no circumstance do I want to walk off the end of an array? I also know that in this course, I will be punished if uh, I walk off the end of an array in a midterm question. I will lose a bunch of marks, and I don't want to do that. So although this condition is a bit more complicated than what I need, maybe having it gives me a sense of security because there's no way I'm walking off the end of an array here. Um, but on the other hand, I still have to attend to the case where the, the loop ended before I've hit the end of the small string. So how am I going to deal with that? Um, I think it's pretty easy, which is, let me just clean up the diagram a bit, if I actually have that case, so suppose I'm inside of my small string, and I am conscious of the fact that the more of these I do, the, the 
poorer my penmanship is on my uh, diagrams of arrays. Um, if the loop ends and I'm not yet at the end of my small string, so the index is still positioned on a character before the end of the small string, well, that means that I must have hit the end of the large string first. Okay, so that in that case, obviously, I don't, I don't want to return one. I don't have a match. How do I detect that? Well, it's pretty easy. If at the end of the loop, the index of the small string is not the null terminator, then I must not have reached the end of the small string. Okay, so um, I'll just say that. I'll say if small string sub i is not equal to a null terminator, well, that means I never got to the end of the small string, which means I never found a match. So um, in this case, we never reached the end of the small string. So there is not a match. So I return zero. All right, I think I've covered my bases there. Um, now to to verify that, I think I should write a couple of quick test cases of is match. I'm going to write those test cases. I'm actually just going to, to double up and use these two strings um, as a way of writing those test cases. So I'm going to write. Um, I'm going to use an if statement here. If uh, is match of, and as the large string, I give it this text to search. As the small string, I'm going to give it search string. But in the meantime, um, if that equals one, uh, I also have to give it an index to search. So uh, I'm going to start with doing index zero. And if I start at index zero, we can see I should see a match. Um, OK, so I'll print that out. Um, uh, found a match. And then the else there will be no match. And I've got a curly bracket problem happening on that else. We'll just add that curly bracket there. There we go. Um, and I'll try running this. Looks like it compiled. Uh, found a match. OK, that's good. Let's test it on index, starting at index 1. If I start searching at index 1 of this string, I do not have a match. So I should expect it to say that there wasn't one. OK, no match. Um, let's try index 2 to make sure that wasn't a fluke. OK, still no match. And now let's see what happens if I search somewhere in the middle. But I've got to figure out what index that is. OK, so there's index 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I think if I start searching at index 12, there should be a match. I hope I didn't miscount. That's going to be a huge pain. OK, index 12 found a match. If I started index 11, though, I should expect that I didn't find a match. All right, no match. Um, OK, now one more test case. Let's try this. Here, I am just going to jam the string directly into the argument for a quick test. Um, so I'm going to do hello world and then make sure that I can, if I start at index 0, I will find a match for the word hello. Just to make sure that using that this modified test case still works, found a match. Um, now I want to see whether if I start at, let's do hello H-E-L. So here's that case I mentioned earlier where the um, I begin finding a match near the end of my string, but the string cuts off before I get there. So I want to make sure that if I start searching at this H here, which would be index, okay, that's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. If I start searching index 6, the answer should be no. There is no match. Uh, no match, okay. And just to verify, if I make sure there is a match, I should expect now the answer to be yes. And it is. OK, so I'm now reasonably confident that is match works. OK, so I'll go up and I'll finish writing count occurrences. So now I check whether the characters of search, that would be my small string using the, the parlance we've just been using, occur starting at position i of my large string text. And now that we have that function, this is not going to be too difficult. So I just call is match. I give it the large string. I give it the start position. That's just i, the index of my loop. And I give it the small string. And if the answer comes back equaling yes, equals 1, and actually, you know, we'll just use the, the typical Boolean um, uh, if statement here, if is match, because we know, of course, it's returning true or false. And if I do say equals equals, I really should say not equal to 0 and not equals equals 1. Um, if I found a match, well, then that would be one more occurrence that I'm counting off. The goal is to count how many matches I find. So if is match returns true, then I add 1 to the count that I'm keeping. 
All right, and you know, I actually don't know if anything else is needed there. It, it's been a while since I've looked at this function since I was operating is match, so maybe I've missed something, but in case I haven't, let's try testing it. So I expect the answer that I get here to be two. Um, I'll add that, remember from earlier, I'm already storing the count in the variable I was provided. That's something I added early on. Okay, so we'll try running this. And it's really upset. Okay, so let's take a look at what, oh yeah, okay. Um, so it, it is complaining. This is a legitimate warning. Um, and the issue is this. It, this is something that we don't run into very often in this course, but it is a good teachable moment. So here's the problem. Um, is match is written with a signature pretty similar to what you see on most string exercises in this course. We generally don't spend much time on the const qualifier when we talk about strings, just because we, our lives are hard enough as it is. So the idea though is that the is match function clearly is not modifying the strings that you give it. Um, but the strings that you give it are provided as just regular arrays, which means the function is allowed to modify those. On the other hand, in count occurrences, I'm passing all of the strings as const char star. And of course, const char star means you're not allowed to modify the contents of the string. Now, this is actually good practice. So writing functions that take const char star is a way of telling the person calling the function, just give me the string, I'm just gonna look at it, I won't touch it, I'm not gonna modify it, which is good programming practice because it's good for somebody that's using the function to know whether you're likely to change their stuff. And also, it's good for you to know whether you're allowed to. If the word const appears here, you're not allowed to modify this string. And if you don't want to, this is sort of useful because this means if you do by accident, the compiler will tell you. Now, why is it complaining? Well, the reason it's complaining is when I pass these strings into is match, the strings are supposed to be constant. They can't be modified. But when I pass them into is match, they're being taken in a form that does allow them to be modified, and that's not allowed. I can't convert a constant thing back to something that I can change. So maybe if I just stick the word const in front of these, um, it'll stop complaining. Uh, and there we go. So here I'm saying, give me a string, we'll call it large string, it's going to be constant, I won't change it. I'll just look at the values, I won't change them. And so now I've got const char here and const char there. And we can see the compiler isn't complaining anymore. Um, and this is also good practice. The isMatch function doesn't need to modify my strings, so I should say that. I should say, I promise I won't modify them. And by the way, the compiler will hold me to that promise. So notice how here it gives me no errors if I compile. Suppose that I do something underhanded, like I say large large string sub zero equals, I don't know, I set it to some other character. Suppose I try to modify it. Um, it's going to say, sorry, you can't do that. You, you're breaking the rules. You made a promise, you're going to keep it. The compiler's, it's really important to the compiler that I keep my promises. Um, this is great. I, it's very useful to have this constraint. If I didn't intend to modify the, the string, then I want the compiler to tell me if I've modified it by accident. Um, and so having the const there in, in string functions is a good practice. It's a good habit to build. In this course, we tend not to require it because you know we're learning programming and there's room for a little bit of flexibility there. And because if you use const qualifiers in one function, you often find that you have to use them in all your other functions as we just saw. And so in this course, you're not marked down for omitting a const qualifier. In CSE 116, that does become a bit of a thing. Okay, so there we go. Uh, the code should now compile again. Um, let's try running it and seeing if the test case works. Okay, so it now says that if I search this string here for the word search, then it comes out um, with two occurrences. Let's just try adding another occurrence to see what happens if um, there are three occurrences. It looks like that works. Let's try searching for the word this. That should give me a total of one occurrence. Okay, let's try searching for the word raspberry, and that should give me presumably zero occurrences. Okay, that looks good. Um, and then, um, let me see. So I've already tested on zero occurrences. I've tested on one occurrence and two occurrences and three occurrences. Let's see what happens if I search for a string that's really small. Um, so I would argue that the smallest real valid input is probably one character. I don't know if it makes sense to search for a string with nothing in it. Uh, maybe we should try it, but I don't think the function should be expected to do anything in particular in that case. If I search for just the string s, well, in that case, I'll find there's one, there's two, there's three, 
there's four, oh, there's a fifth one at the end of the word this. Um, let's see, do I have any other, uh, there's no, no other real patterns sitting inside of this string that I can see at least. Um, so I'm gonna actually ask ChatGPT for some more test cases. Um, in fact, because I haven't changed the template beyond a couple of minor custodial rearrangements, I might be able to ask ChatGPT for another main function that contains more test cases. One thing I know is that ChatGPT is pretty good at writing test cases for you. Um, however, I will add that at this point, I've done enough testing of this, even with this one input string, that I'm reasonably confident that the function works. Um, the one thing I have not tested though is, what happens if I use uppercase letters? I, I do sort of know what's going to happen, but let's just see what happens if I do that. I'm gonna look for the word search with a capital S, and I expect it to give me two occurrences, not three, because there are three occurrences the word search, but only two of them have a capital S. And sure enough, I'm getting a two there. Um, all right, so we'll save that. And now let's go back over and ask ChatGPT. Um, we'll scroll all the way down. And I'm gonna give credit where credit is due. Those were great. Um, can you give me a new main function that contains at least three test cases of each of those functions? Absolutely. Okay, let's see what it comes up with. There are the exercises, just like before. Um, and now it looks like it's, um, okay, yep, it looks like it makes three arrays. Oh, whoops, well, okay, we'll just wait for it to finish and then I'll copy and paste the code. Um, okay, so I'm gonna copy the whole thing using the handy copy button and then we'll, does it say anything else? It just says, yeah, these are, here are some test cases, try them out pretty much. Uh, I'm gonna go and grab my main function here. Actually, I'm gonna comment this out. I wanna save this in the version um, that I keep for later. Okay, so I'm gonna comment out the original main function. I'm gonna paste in the new stuff. Now the new stuff also contains copies of the template. I'm gonna quickly verify that the template didn't change. It looks like it's the same as it was before. ChatGPT sometimes forgets what it's doing. Okay, so now, um, it, it's given me three test cases for the, ex the substring function. So one of them is starting with the string extract this substring. I think it's the same test case we had before. And then I try extracting a few characters from hello world. I start at index zero and go to index five. That should be the word hello. And then it starts with this rather unimaginative string testing one, two, three. I start at character number four. That would be, I think this, and I copy three characters. It should be ing. And, oh, actually, wait a minute. I could ask ChatGPT for the correct output. Um, what is the expected output? Um, uh, for that main function. Now remember that ChatGPT sometimes makes huge mistakes with output, so we'll take this with a grain of salt. I'm gonna copy this though and bring it back over and um, I'm gonna write, uh, okay, this is the um, extra test cases generated by ChatGPT. Um, and here is the expected output. So I'll just paste in that output that it gave. Okay, so uh, the the first, so it should print this. Let's just run the code and see what it does. And it generates um, for extracted one, it says this subs. And for extracted two, it says hello. And for extracted C, uh, three, it says ing. Um, obviously this should worry me a little bit. I'm gonna come back to this in a minute. Um, Okay, so for the convert to uppercase, the first string is convert me to uppercase. Okay, that's that looks good. Uppercase me too, fair enough. Uh, and then mixed case string. Okay, so ChatGPT has managed to generate a little bit of diversity in its test cases, although I'm noticing that none of the test cases involve digits, but we already tested that, so that looks good. Um, and then finally, we've got um, these three test cases of count occurrences. And in this one, it's the same test case as before. Search this search text. So I should see two occurrences of this string here, and I do. Count the, okay. Count the count and the counting counts. Fair enough. I see four occurrences of the word count. And then I search for the word search in the string that says no matches here. And it gives me zero matches. That looks good. And of course, given that it seems like ChatGPT understood my request, I could ask it for like 10 extra test cases. Remember though, that just because your output matches the model output or doesn't, if it's ChatGPT generating it, doesn't mean it's correct or not. Um, we still have to validate, still do our due diligence on ChatGPT work because it doesn't necessarily do its own due diligence and we may have some evidence of that. So what's happening with, ex with extracted one? 
So the string is extract this substring, and I begin at index eight. Okay, well, this is index zero. Okay, so that means that I'm at the end of index one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This character, the T, is index eight, and I wanna copy nine characters. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So the answer is what I printed. My function is correct, this subs. Um, and ChatGPT's answer is something else. It's substring. Okay, now ChatGPT did, so, did a great job making exercises, a pretty much great job at um, giving me model output, but I need to tell it that it made a mistake here. So um, that looks basically good. Um, you did a great job generating the exercises. I'm gonna give it 100%, 100% A+. Plus. Um, on the model output, uh, I'll give you 90%. That's that's still an A+, plus, uh, still an A+, plus, uh, because it looks like you made a mistake on the first line. Extracted one should be this subs. And let's see what it says. Thank you for the feedback. I'm glad to hear the exercises were helpful. I apologize for the mistake in the first line of the expected output. Now, strangely, this time it didn't generate new expected output. Can you generate corrected? Maybe it doesn't like being graded. Um, corrected um, expected output. Certainly, here you go. Uh, and so it generates this corrected output, which does match what I have, so this is now correct. But remember, when you tell ChatGPT it made a mistake, often it just believes you even if you're wrong. So for, let's just test that out. So I'm gonna try gaslighting ChatGPT again. Um, you made another mistake. Um, extracted two should be world, not hello. Let's see if it can understand and can tell me that I'm wrong. Nope, yeah. I apologize for the oversight. You're absolutely right. No, I'm not right. You 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 trust me way too much. I make mistakes too. Um, so as you can see, take this with a grain of salt. Um, and also, don't try and teach ChatGPT a lesson. You can tell it it's wrong all day long. It doesn't actually learn anything from what you tell it in this context. But as you can see, ChatGPT is a useful tool, but um, when it begins making mistakes, often then you've got to be very careful because even its corrected versions sometimes don't fix those mistakes or introduce other mistakes or become completely surreal, as we've now seen several times. But there we go. I've done some exercises involving functions uh, that take strings as arguments. I've even implemented these sort of weird exercises like this one that doesn't have a return value, but instead stores its result using a pointer. But there we go, we got that to work. I was even able to do one exercise that requi required writing some auxiliary function, and I'm glad I did. So in is match, before I wrote it, I was sort of on the fence about whether to put all the loops inside this while loop, but having written is match, I now realize it was a really good idea to write a function. If I had tried to do that with nested loops, it probably would have been a huge mess. Not just a mess to explain, but I might have had a lot of trouble debugging it. So I'm sort of pleased that I ended up writing a function. If you know when to add extra functions, you can save yourselves lots of time.